Hello, my friends. Jerry Rosa here in the Rosa String Works Workshop. How are y'all doing this morning? That was a fun time last night. And it looks like we already got people scrolling up the screen here on the comments. Papa from uh, California and Bill Allen from the UK. So good, good to see you guys there. Thanks for joining in. Uh, yeah, I really enjoyed last night. I thought it was so much fun. And um, it was so much fun. In fact, I thought, you know, this would be a good opportunity to just take it another step further and uh, talk about how I play lead on the mandolin. And uh, so that's what the, the majority of the discussion is going to be about today. I'll remind everybody that if you have questions or comments uh, that you want me to see for sure, be sure to put uh, a bunch of question marks in front of the comment. In other words, start it with like three question marks and then I can scroll down and see it much faster because I'm a very poor reader. It takes me a while to see everything on the screen and to actually process it in my brain. I think I'm slightly dyslexic or something. But anyway, um, it looks like we have 26 viewers already. Uh, so I thought I would, you know, actually show my method. You know, I started out a few years ago trying to write uh, or create video series on my method of playing lead. And to be honest with you, I got stuck uh, part of the way into it. It just, I don't know, I, I just felt like it was an overwhelming task in one way. So then you might say, well, then why do you think you can do that on a live video, kind of just ad lib? And that's what this is. I don't have anything pre-planned, you understand. This is just going to be showing you as we go how I play lead. Well, I don't necessarily think I can accomplish the whole thing here in one video, but I do think that uh, if you have an open mind and you uh, can try to shake loose from what you already know, that's the hardest part is to try to leave what you already know behind and not try to compare what I'm about to show you with what you already know. If you can do that, you'll go, oh, wow, I can't believe it's that easy. Because truly, the way I play, I honestly don't think it could be done easier. I know absolutely nothing about formal music. I mean, I'm seriously telling you, I know nothing about formal music. I really don't even know scales or understand scales. I don't know notes. I don't know any of the measure things. I don't know anything about that stuff. I mean, I've heard the terms, but that's all there is to it. I just heard the terms, you know. So what I'm about to show you is based on absolute common sense and simplicity. It's just Simple as it can be. If you really boil it down, it, it's just one pattern. And you're going to go, huh? You can't play music with just one pattern. Well, somehow I do. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Now, realistically, it's more like two patterns, I'll be honest. But it's kind of the same pattern. It's just in a different location, sort of. Um, if you happen to have already taken my mandolin course, if you've purchased that and gone through that, this lead playing that I'm about to show you will make a lot more sense because it's based on that chord training that I teach with the Nashville number system. You know, and, and let me just give you a brief, brief overview of that. The basis of the way I understand the Nashville number system is totally different than just about everybody else. The way I understand it is based right on my fretboard. I don't stop and count it on my hand like most people do with the Nashville number system, or at least think about it that way. I don't think about it that way at all. I do it out of positions right off of the fretboard. Everything I teach is in the same relative position on everything. There's basically two patterns. It's just that simple. If you can learn two lousy patterns, you can play any song in the universe. Period. End of discussion. It's all over with. It's that simple. Whether you want to believe it or not, that's the truth. 
with just two patterns. And so my training on the Nashville number system goes into that in depth and explains how simple it is. The hardest part you will have with it is if you already understand formal music. You, you won't be able to turn that loose and see how simple it really is. It's a myth that music is complicated. If you learn it the formal way, music is complicated like math. It's like calculus. It's like, it's like higher math when you really learn the formal training of music. When you learn it with my method, it's like a kindergarten show and tell. I mean, it's that, it's that drastically different, and I'm not kidding. And if you can let yourself go that low and that simple, then what I'm about to show you will possibly change your life, especially if you've been struggling with music. That's the best way I can explain it. Um, I'm not bragging, you understand. I got to give you the first couple of almost apology caveats. The first couple of cats, because there's going to be haters. You know, there's people out there, your mandolin playing sucks. You don't sound like Sierra Hole. You can't play like Sam Bush. You just beat on it. Okay, fine. I know I don't sound like any of those really highly respected mandolin players. I know that. In fact, those guys look at me and go, how are you doing that? I've never seen anybody do it like that before. And this is the truth. I have my own method, and I just feel like I should at least tell you, and I know most of you have already heard this story, so I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. I had just barely learned how to play a mandolin. And I'd only been playing about a month. My uncle walks up behind me. I didn't even know he was there, and he was listening to me. And then he stops me, and he says, Son, how long have you been playing that mandolin? He says, I didn't know you played mandolin. And I said, Well, I've only been playing it about a month. And he goes, Well, boy, for a month you're doing so good. He says, But... He says, I can't hear you. You sound wimpy, and you need to learn how to play double notes. And he left. Now, my uncle was highly respected. He, he was one of the Bill Monroe-style mandolin players that was just killer. He really was. So I had a lot of respect for him, and I take to heart what he said. But I, I was so new at music, I didn't understand what he meant. He said, you sound wimpy. I can't hear you. you got to learn how to play double notes. Well, I took that to heart. Man, I thought single notes was hard enough. So what I'm about to show you really is mostly playing double notes, but again, it's just kind of one pattern. I mean, it's pretty dang simple. It really is. It's hard to, to see through all the complication to see how simple it is. The next thing I'm going to tell you about this is that the more complicated the song is, the more chords that are in it, you're not even going to believe I'm going to say this, but the truth is, the simpler it is to play. And you're going to go, oh, yeah, right. I'm seriously telling you. I, in fact, the, example, the song I'm going to use as my example has seven chords in it. Now, that's a pretty complicated song, you know. How often do you teach somebody something and you start off with the most complicated song rather than the simplest song? That's to show you how simple my method is. Will it make you sound like Sam Bush and Sierra Hall? Absolutely, completely not. It will not make you sound that way. Will you be able to play any song that anybody throws at you in any jam the first time you hear it? If you practice what I'm about to show you and apply it, absolutely for sure you can. You can hang with the big boys. You may not sound exactly like them, but you can hang with them. You know, and that's kind of where I'm at in my life. And I don't care. I don't have the goal to be the best mandolin player in the world. I just like to have fun, and I like to be able to play almost anything that anybody throws at me. You know, I have good moments and bad moments, just like everybody. There's some songs I get through, and it sounds like, wow, he really knows how to play that. And all I'm doing is applying my pattern. Other times, it's like, yeah, not so much. <laughs> you know, and the next time you play it, you do better, you know, and it's just the way it is. Okay, let's see if we can help you with some of this. 
again, I'm not necessarily doing this to try to sell my Nashville number system training on the mandolin, but seriously, you ought to give it a thought, and you ought to possibly purchase it and go through it. Uh, you, it. It couldn't change your life. I get comments all the time, and I mean all the time, and people are saying, oh my gosh, I wish I would have learned this 30 years ago. I get That's the main comment. It's just, it's like that. If I would have learned this when I was a kid, I would have went to Nashville. You know, that kind of thing. And the truth is, had I understood it when I was a kid, I probably would have went to Nashville too. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. So, and, and this is just another example of a, of a couple things you will learn in that other training if you, t if you bought that training. For instance, they're just tips and tricks. And one of the tips is that when you're playing a mandolin, almost all the time, and there's always exceptions to everything, just you have to understand that. But when you can, when you can guess nine out of 10 times and be right, you're doing some good guessing. So that's basically how I show you. It's common sense. It's, it's, getting, it's giving you the nine out of 10 times trial. Okay, so the first, this is just one of the kind of tips that you would learn in that other training. One of the tips is that almost all the time, your middle finger is in a dotted fret. Almost all the time. There's exceptions, but they're pretty rare. You know, one of, the rare, one of the exceptions would be if you're playing in a flat. Well, then obviously you're not in a dotted fret. Like if I'm playing in B flat, well, it's not going to be in a dotted fret. But for the most part, if you're just playing in your regular keys, you know, A, you know, a B, C, D, E, F, G, then you're going to be pretty much, for the most part, in a dotted fret. Not all the time, but most of the time. Okay. So that's just that's just a simple tip, a simple trick that you can that sure doesn't hurt to know that you know. Um, another simple uh, tip and trick, and this would again would be learned in that other training is, and there's like eleven rules in that other training. If you learn those eleven rules, you can play anything. Okay, so. One of, one of those rules is like when you play a two chord, and if you don't know what a two chord is, that's covered in the other training, but it, when you play a two chord, then the next chord you're gonna play is a five chord. And it's like 95% of the time. So every time you go to a two chord, you know your next change is gonna be to a five chord. Just that simple. Those are the kinds of rules that change your life because you don't have to go, where did you go after that? you'll know where you go after that because it just happens. It's just the way music is. I didn't create that. That's just the way music is. And when you understand the Nashville number system the way I understand it rather than the way they typically teach it, because I only learn things the common sense way. And um, bingo, pango, it's just that simple. It just, it's just those kinds of rules. It, 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 there's 11 of them. And they will... If you don't understand those 11 rules, when you do, it will change your life. Okay. Um, all right. So let's move on to this, and we'll try to talk about how I actually play lead. Well, you know, don't get me wrong. I can play a scale. I just don't know what to do with it after I play it. <laughs> Okay, so I can do it. My question is, what's, what good is that? <laughs> and I know, I, you know, on a deeper level, I do understand what people do with that. I just don't need to know what they do with it. That's the, that's the difference. It doesn't matter to me what they do with it because I don't use that method of thinking or that method of playing at all. I play totally out of chord positions. Some of you are instantly going to jump in and say, well, that's the way I play too. You probably do, and maybe you do that on a guitar. The problem is with a guitar is every chord is in a different shape. So therefore, if you're playing out of chords in, on a guitar, you can't really just have one pattern. On a mandolin, if you play the way I teach you to play in my actual training, again, back to that training, if you learn to play that way, you basically just use one chord shape. 
and you just move that shape around. And technically, it's two shapes because you have to change it when you go from the bottom two strings up to the middle two strings. So you have to change it a little bit. And so there's two patterns rather than just one, but it's basically the same thing once you actually fully understand it. Okay, so I'm playing totally out of chord positions. See, when my uncle said you need to learn how to play double notes, he, he only meant throw in some double notes for accent. But that's not what he said. He said you need to learn how to play double notes. And I took him literally. So I went back for a solid year, and I tried to figure out, how the heck do you play double notes? Single notes is crazy hard. Well, it turns out double notes now, for me, is probably simpler than to play single notes. Because I only I do the same thing no matter what key I'm in, no matter what chord I'm in, I just do the same thing. There's only so many double notes that you can get out of your chord. All right, so... What do I mean by double notes? I mean literally the chord positions themselves. These two fingers are double notes. Those two fingers are double notes. And you can take variations of that. For instance, here and here, or like here, like that. So there's G. And there's another place out of G. But I, so I use my little finger a lot. And then when you go to C, you're just doing the exact same thing. Exact same thing. So it, what, it, what you have to do is you have to spend time in each, you know, really, you can just do it in G. You don't even have to care about the rest of the chords. You just spend time in G and figure out where all those double notes are and what they sound like. And then you start applying them. Um, so like, the, like the, the standard two finger, that's obviously part of it. Then you add this one here, like this. So I'm just taking, I'm not even hitting this one. I'm just hitting these two. Hitting these two. Now I'm up to C, doing the same thing basically. See, so and then and then that your your ex your little finger, you know, it skips a fret also and hits notes in combination with these other fingers. And that's all you're really doing is you're just learning where your harmony notes are without a out of one chord. And then you just move it anywhere and you do the same exact thing no matter where you are. Doesn't matter. So you really only have to learn one pattern. It's just, it's a little complicated to learn it. I'll admit that. But once you learn it, that's all you got to learn. You don't have to keep learning more stuff. <laughs> I think that's why I was able to do it. It's that simple. It's really that simple. Um, yeah, I realize that it sounds a little bit more complicated than I started out telling you. But once you learn it, you got it, you know. And you, you just gotta kind of get those sounds down. And I'll show you here in a minute how you apply them. But I'm just just showing you what how I learned how to play the double notes was just by doing this. And it took me a year to figure it out on my own because I hadn't I didn't even know what I was trying to do, to be truthful. I didn't. And when I got done doing it, this is how it where I landed, you know? <laughs> and that's really all it boils down to. Um Another tip and trick, and I think I may even talk about this in my actual training, but for playing lead now, when you go to minors, it's a little bit different. I, but I have a method again for playing minors. And it's just kind of one thing again. And like your minors, see, like any chord on a mandolin, all you have to do, and I say all because it's not that simple because it takes some practice, but all you have to do is just move that finger back one fret and you got a minor. So that G turns into a G minor. There's your G major, there's your G minor. Same play, same thing in an A. See, that's the thing about everything you do on a mandolin, if you follow my method, 
everything is relative from where you start and everything works the same no matter where you are. So like here in A, if I want to make an A minor, there's A minor. If I'm in D, here's a D minor. Same difference. Everything's the same. C, C minor. If I'm in B flat, B flat minor. Just that simple. Just move that one finger. So, but now here's how you actually play lead on, um, on a minor song. You know, you all you do is you just stay in the same three frets that your fingers are in. You, if you just stay in those three frets, I'm not saying that everybody does this. I'm just saying this is the simple way to do it. You just stay in those three frets, and almost anything you play in those three frets is going to work, believe it or not. All right, like here's a little bit of Nashville blues. I'll try to play it really slow. Well, let me play it a little bit towards speed first. I'll, I'll still slow it down a little bit, and then I'll play it really slow if I can. So I'm just staying in those three frets until that one, there's a major chord in that song. So you, uh, that one moment there, that one beat, I, I switch to the straight D. But the rest of it's just staying up and down in, the, in, in those three frets. That's pretty much it. I mean, I slide across a little bit. That's just a technique that you use on mandolins or guitars. You, you do a slide every once in a while for effect and things. But for the most part, I'm just staying in those three frets. Pretty simple, really. So let me slow, see if I can slow it down even more. And then you can add your own flair to that. I'm just trying to show you shortcuts of things that you can do to play. You're really simple, you know. Now, you might say, well, that's good for that song, but what about Johnny Comes Marching Home, okay? Well, I, I play that on a G minor generally, so we're gonna basically just come up here and get our G minor. went all the way down here. For the most part, most of that song is played in those three frets. And you probably could make a case where I went down here, I could have just hit an open string up here, or uh, I could have hit an open A, but I don't typically hit open strings. I mostly play closed strings because of my method. Because when you don't hit open strings, when you play all closed strings, then you can switch anywhere and play the same thing ex anywhere on the fretboard. So that way, it doesn't matter what key someone wants to play the song in, you can play it and do the exact same thing that you just did up here. Like if I wanted to play that in B flat, which I have no idea why I would, but I could. Let's see, um. It's just doing the same thing. Now, I get, I gotta be honest, I'm used to it up here and it's just simpler for me because I've played it for years and years and years and years up here. But if I have to, I could play it in B flat if I have to, you know. My point is that everything I do on mandolin is the same no matter where I do it. <laughs> That's part of why I'll never sound like Sam Bush or Sarah Hall 
because it limits you to some degree. But like I said, if your goal is to just hang with the big boys and be able to play anything you hear, then this method will do that for you. Um, it doesn't necessarily make you the best mandolin player in the world. I know that. Okay? You don't have to tell me that. I know that. It's got some limits. All right, so now let me show you that really complicated song I said I was going to show you with my actual normal method that's not a minor. This is going to be just regular chords. We're going to play Redwood Hill. It's a very complicated song. So it, and I'm going to call out the chords. Uh, well, I'm going to, I'll just sing a line or two of it first so you get the idea of what the song sounds like. I, it's, I'm playing it out of G. I climbed the Redwood Hill. It was on rainy day you rise above the throng and to talk to mother nature for a while she told me of her love for the children in her touch and of her great concern for the likes of you and me and us Crying though she was She did speak these tender words The thing that I am I could not change for any be still and how the rain did fall as I found my way back down the redwood hill okay that's all the way through the song one time and you saw there's lots of chord changes lots of it's even got one little a minor in there you know um, okay so so like if we're playing out of G's we, we start we go G D, E minor, down to B, to C, G, A, D, G, D, E minor, to B. Here's that minor bridge part. E minor. <laughs> Crying though she was, she did speak, speak. Back to G. Then we go to C, E minor. D, and then back to C. Anyway, that's, I'm belaboring the point. So now let me show you how I play it. And, it's, and I'm going to call out the chords as I play the lead to it, which is something not that many mandolin players can do because it's hard to think of what chord you're in when you're playing out of scales. With me, I'm totally playing out of chords, period. Just that simple. So it's very easy for me to tell you what chord I'm playing my lead notes in. So G, D, E minor, B, C, G, A, D, G, D, E minor, B, C, G, A, E minor. Actually, I don't play that part lead most of the time, so now I'm starting to have to think about that part. But anyway, that 
that was what you play on the lead of that song for the most part. So my point is, I'm only playing out of chord positions. And the more chords it has, the more it sounds like the doggone song. Because I don't have to put, because it changes so fast. And as long as you're hitting a, what, and I'm going to go back to my Butch Baldessari days when I went to his mandolin workshop. He, he called them the critical notes. So as long as you're hitting the critical notes in that chord, as you switch through the song, it sounds like the song. You don't have to hit every note. If you hit the critical notes, it sounds like the song. And the more chords there are, the easier it is to accidentally do that. <laughs> and the point of this is, is even on a song you've never heard before, as long as you get the chord progression down, now granted, on a song that complicated, that's not that easy to do the first time through it, I'll admit that. But that's not the point I'm making here. But the point is, on your average song, when you get the chord progression down, you basically just do the same thing. You just play some of those notes, those critical notes, out of those chords that I showed you. song every single time. I just do the same thing. It's just kind of one pattern. It may make you think that, well, boy, that's really one-dimensional. Okay, it's one-dimensional. But, you know, and you can, you can learn how to change that up a little bit and how to flare that out a little bit. You know what I mean? You can add your own style to it. But it is that doggone simple. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> it's... You know, I'm just being truthful. That's the, how simple it is. I really am not doing anything complicated at all. You know, all that formal stuff, all that scale stuff, all that understanding, all that other stuff, that's great if that's what you want to learn. I'm not knocking any of that. But it's really complicated. This is really simple. <laughs> it's just nothing to it. And like I said, if you took my mandolin course, and again, I know it sounds like a sales pitch, but I'm just trying to help you with, if you're struggling, I'm seriously telling you, it can change your life. It'll make it seem so simple. If you can just go through my original mandolin training on the National Number System, I've had lots of people just tell me that they just can't believe how simple it is. They never dreamed music was that easy. Okay, I'm done. I'm over it. I hope I haven't just bored you to tears. We, are, we don't have very many viewers today for a change. I guess nobody really cares how I play mandolin. <laughs> After you hear me play, it's pretty obvious you don't really you know, want to play like me for the most part. Okay, let's go back to the top here and see if we can find where the questions started. And we'll just see what we can do about answering them. Billy Porterfield, can you tell us what your plans are for the repair video? Seems like this has taken a backseat to all the other stuff. The repairs are what draws me to your channel. Well, I'm starting with setup because, uh, Billy, regardless whether you think repair is the most important or not, setup is 90% of your business if you do what I do. You'll get way more setups than you will repairs. Repairs scans such a huge gamut that, you know, I'm, I'm having to put a little more thought into that for one thing and of how I would even try to train that. But uh, I will get to it eventually. I'm, I'm starting on uh, the setup because that's the thing everybody wants to know, how to make their instrument play better. And setup is a harder skill than repair is. I'll tell you that right now. So anyway, 
Uh, yeah, so I'm not putting it off. I'm just starting with one thing and then going to the next. And so setup is, I would say my setup is half finished already, maybe a little more. Um, I have to do some more editing, a lot of editing on the videos. That's the hardest part of it. But uh, I won't be long before I'll be into the repair part. Um, Lee says, you're just sharing what you know, and we appreciate you. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, I don't know a lot. I'm, I'm not even going to try to pull any wool off it over anybody's eyes. I don't know a lot. I really don't. I just know what I know. Um... Let's see. Looking for the next bunch of question marks. Okay, I think the next one I see is Roberto Rosendo. This is good to start, but it's so limiting. Well, Roberto, yeah, I, it, it sort of is. And then again, it's not all that limiting if you start to apply it. I taught uh, Joe Dean with this method. And, you know, when you teach young kids with this method, they take it and all you see is taillights leaving. They get it like this. I mean, like that. You can't feed it to them fast enough. If, they're, if they have a drive and you show them, and I show them my method, my training that I have out already, plus this lead stuff, how I do it, they take it and they run with it. And, of course, they add on. And in, in a few months, they're playing like Sam Bush and, and all the rest of them. But it's a good foundation. It's a great place to start. So there you go. I'm 67, and I have no intentions of trying to outdo Sam Bush. So there you go. Um, Uh, he's saying that mandolin sounds great. By the way, I didn't tell you which mandolin this was. Today, I you know I switched to this one because it has the dots, and you can see that much better than those flowers with the vine and everything. This is, um, by the way, just to tell you, this one is mandolin number, um, well, it's the 32nd instrument I built, and it's mandolin number 26. And the reason I kept this one is I just, coincidentally, accidentally finished it on my grandson's birthday. And I mean the actual day he was born, May 21st, 09. He was born that morning, and I finished this mandolin that day. And it just so happens my wife's birthday is also May 21st. Of course, it wasn't 09, but uh, anyway, <laughs> you know. So because this has the birthday of my grandson, my first grandson, and my wife, I never sold this mandolin. I just kept it. Uh, and that one is, by the way, made out of sycamore. Uh, sycamore back and sides. And it is a good mandolin. I really like it. It's, it's a great mandolin. I, I've kept about, I don't know, five mandolins, something like that, that I've made. Or at least there five. I think there's maybe even six or seven in the overall family. My daughter, my son, that kind of thing. But uh, all the rest of them are gone. Um, Anyway, so that's the story on that mandolin. Um, next question. Lon says, could you make a mandolin trout fishing lure? Like if you're anyone, could you could. <laughs> uh, make a mandolin fishing lure. Yeah, I probably could, actually. <laughs> I have made, I know you're probably going to say, oh, yeah, now here it goes again. I have made fishing lures from scratch. Matter of fact, I got one in my tackle box now. It works pretty good, actually. And I definitely tied a lot of flies myself and made my own flies. I, I used to fish a lot. Yeah, uh, I like a, I apologize in advance. That's his name. He says uh, the goal should be to have fun playing, and you know, and and I agree. That's that's my whole thing about playing music, and 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 if you if you can read between the lines what I'm talking to. I'm talking to the people out there that have been struggling. You don't have to struggle. It's not that complicated. It's pretty doggone simple. As long as you've got timing, the rest of it will take care of itself if you just follow these little simple methods I'm showing you. It, it don't take that long. Gary Boer. Oh, thank you, Gary. I really appreciate the super chat there. Thank you so much. Um. <clears throat> What do you use to buff a varnish 
uh, finish? Well, I, you know, it depends whether I want to do it by hand or not. Um, if I'm doing it by hand, I, I use the uh, semi-chrome polish, you know, and I buff it out with that. And uh, just a damp cloth, uh, I apply it with that and rub it in really good and rub it, you know, pretty vigorously. And then I just take the, the dry blue cloth and buff it off. And it does a pretty darn good job. Um, if I'm doing it with my buffing wheel, which is from Stumac, well, then I use their buffing compounds on that. So, you know, that's a different story. Gary says, thanks for the lesson. I play banjo, and this is the best system for old man to learn some mando. <laughs> well, you know, it is so simple. It truly is. I, you know, and and it truly is unique to me for the most part. I mean, I have heard uh, and sort of seen other people sort of kind of do something similar, but mine's pretty black and white. It's pretty straightforward how I do it. It's, I do the same thing in every key, no matter where I'm at. Yeah, that part's a little bit limiting, and but the difference is you start to put a little more flair in it over time. You learn how to flare it out a little bit more. I didn't need to take it to that next level like the kids do that I teach. You know, and, and the, again, I'm not just patting myself on the back, but the truth is I have taught a lot of kids this way, and they've gone on to do wonderful things. Joe Dean is the best example I have. I taught him how to use my method, and this is a true story, and I'm, I'm not making this up. I, I, it's a true, 100% true story. I used to be the president of the Missouri Area Bluegrass Committee, and because of that, or the chairman, or whatever you want to call it, and so I had to run the meetings. We had monthly meetings, and the monthly meetings, we would also play music at the meeting after the meeting was over. So I tried to keep the meeting short, like 30 minutes, that kind of thing, and then we would just jam the rest of the evening. Well, while I'm preparing for the meeting, I'm hearing music in the background because some, some of the guys before the meeting starts, they'll get them out and they play a little bit before the meeting too, you know. So I'm hearing this music and I'm thinking, boy, that really sounds familiar. But I wasn't concentrating on the music. I'm concentrating on getting my papers in order and all the stuff. And I keep thinking, boy, that sounds familiar. And, you know, and I'm just working on this stuff and, man, that really sounds familiar. What is that? You know, <laughs> I turn around and Joe Dean, he's 11 years old. He's playing exactly like me. <laughs> I just dropped everything. I ran over to him, and I, and I literally grabbed his mandolin like this. He's in the middle of playing, and I just grab it, and I said, stop. <laughs> I, I was worried I had just created a monster. And I, and I said, look, stop, stop, stop. He's going, what's wrong? And he's, you know, he's just a little kid, so he's worried that he's doing something wrong. You know, I go... There's nothing wrong at all. It's, in fact, it's too good. <laughs> I said, you're playing like me. You don't want to play like me. <laughs> I said, you want to play like, like this guy. And I handed him Doyle Lawson's CD. I said, learn to play like this guy. <laughs> but I had showed him with my method, you know, and I just wanted to take him to the next level. The next time I heard him, he was playing like Doyle Lawson, you know. I mean, <laughs> then he went on to play with... Um, Daly and Vincent, and the three years he played with them, and he switched over to banjo at that point, and he, the three years that he was with Daly and Vincent, they won Entertainer of the Year. They didn't win it before or after that. They, uh, they, uh, he went over, then he switched over to Doyle Lawson and played with Doyle for about eight or nine years, or maybe longer, I'm not really sure, and, um, you know, did very well with Doyle also. And matter of fact, one time I, I said to Doyle, I says, uh, I said, uh, do you realize I introduced your uh, banjo player to bluegrass, right? He goes, and then we went on, had a little discussion. He goes, well, that was mighty fortunate for me. <laughs> That's what he said. I thought that was a cute answer the way he said that. Well, he says, you're introducing him to bluegrass was mighty fortunate for me. <laughs> Anyway, Alan Dust uh, has the next question. It says, upright bass has a crack from the sound post pressure on the back. Uh, repair method, suggestion, ideas. Um, okay, on the back. Now, uh, the question, uh, I have to know more. I, you know, is it a plywood back or is it a solid back? 
Um, more than likely, it's a solid back if it's got a crack there because the plywood typically doesn't crack there. So I'm going to assume it's a solid back. And because of that, um, you know, I, I would get all the pressure off of it first, you know, um, and I would uh, try to use a good wood glue, whether it's tight bond, it doesn't matter, but a good wood glue, it could be Elmer's wood glue, it doesn't really matter. And, you know, and, and, and work that glue into that crack as good as you can get it down in there. And if you have to use suction cups or, you know, I use the paintbrush method with water and I wet the crack down first and then I just work that glue into that and that water will let the glue flow down in there a lot better. And try to see on the inside if it's actually coming through and vice versa. Try to get the glue all the way through. Clamp that up as good as you can and get, let that set first. Then the next thing to do is to make yourself a um, a patch, um, you know, and because if it's where the sound post goes, you're going to want to make a little bit larger patch than you need. So maybe a, a patch in the neighborhood of two inches round, something like that. And you're going to want to put that patch, and it ne needs, and it should be thin, you know, like don't make it real thick, like a quarter inch thick. Make it. Mm, Maybe a hundred thousandths of an inch thick would probably be the maximum. So that's less than an eighth of an inch uh, thick. And you're going to want to put that, you know, with the grain going crossways. So in other words, the grain in the back is running this way. You're going to want the patch to go in this way. You're going to want the, you want to want the grain to be opposing and, and get that patch glued in there. Now I know that that may not be that easy to do since you're probably talking through the sound hole. But it can be done even through the sound hole if you think it through and maybe get you some wires with some little pointy bits that you can put this down in there and then more or less set your sound post in place on top of the patch, that kind of thing for a clamp. It can be done. It's not simple, but it can be done. So, Alan, that's the best I've got for you, buddy. I hope that helps you. Um, Billy Porterfield my question above was in regard to the day-to-day -day repairs that you used to do, not the new instructional video. Uh, the day-to-day -day repairs that I used to do. Well, I haven't had that many in the shop lately. I mean, I had that, that mandolin. There, there, matter of fact, she's working on that video right now where I had to repair that neck and all that. So, I mean, I've been putting out a series on that Alvarez mandolin. Uh, in fact, it's She's doing the final video right now, but she's going to break it into two parts because it's such a long video. So part of that will come out tonight, and hopefully the other part will be out really soon because I think she's got it all done. So we might even put both parts out at the same time. I don't know. But anyway, it's, so I'm, it's not that I don't do repairs. It's just that I take them in the order that I have them. I have seven of them up on the shelf up there now, the next one, I don't even know what the next one is. I don't know if it's a setup. I don't know if it's a repair. You know, I just take them in order. So, so there's nothing, you know, there's nothing that I'm not doing that I used to do before. It's just I'm, you know, doing it on a smaller scale and I'm taking what comes to me when it comes. Um, Al, uh, Alonzo Quisada. Alonzo Quesada says, can you do a video on electronic tuners? I found differences between Baranda and phone apps. Do you use internal mic cable to tune? Well, Alonzo, you know, I hear that a lot. I hear it all the time, in fact. In fact, I hear it from just about everybody that those tuners are different. They'll, they'll change and they'll I got to be honest with you, and I'm just telling you as me talking, I don't, I can't speak for anybody else, but I did a test one time. I took like eight or nine electronic tuners because I used to sell them, so I had a whole bunch of them, and I tried eight or nine of them, and every single one of them was spot dead straight in the middle on every single thing. That's my experience, so I don't see that they lie to you. I don't see that they're different. I hear it from all kinds of people all the time. That's just the difference that with me and somebody else. 
I think they're pretty doggone accurate. Now, the caveats are you got to have fresh batteries. You know, the batteries all have to be about equal, that sort of thing, because as the batteries get weak, they will change a little bit then. All things being equal, I don't find any difference. I really don't. It's, I mean, a dog couldn't hear the difference, at least on every... And I've done some recent tests that way, too, and I don't find any difference. Even though I know quite a few people that will tell me they're different, I don't see that at all. And I've tested what they tell me to test, and I don't see any difference. So that's my story, Alonzo. I'm sorry that you're seeing it differently, but I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that's my experience. Daryl, uh, re, I don't know how to pronounce that last name. R e a u m e. Is your Mando method uh, text only or video? No, it is is ninety nine percent video. There are some. Uh, there's one page of the Nashville number system rules that you can print off, and there's eleven rules. And I'm not kidding you when I tell you this. If you really apply those 11 rules, you can play anything. <laughs> I'm seriously telling you. It will help you. Like that complicated song that I just showed you, it will tell you how to think about that and how you know what's coming and how you... It, it just evolves into that. It makes playing complicated chords much easier. So, I, again, I... I know it sounds like a sales pitch. I'm not trying to sell it so much as I'm trying to convince you that if you've been struggling with music and you've been thinking it's hard, you need to try my approach because it's not hard. It's really doggone simple, actually. It really is. I'm not kidding. Oh, okay. That's it. I'm going fishing. More thumbs up. <laughs> uh, let's see here. I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up there in the uh, emojis. Mike Soba or Saba, what is the difference between true oil and Danish oil and tongue oil? And should you wax these finishes? Well, I got to be truthful about that, Mike. I can't honestly speak to that. Uh, I only tell you things that I know. And I know true oil varnish is a varnish. I, I can't exactly say that that's how that's different than the, the Danish and the, and the tongue oil. Some of these other folks in the comments I'm sure can, but I don't know that much about it. The difference for me with the true oil is that it's a good hard finish. And see, that's what you want to end up with. On an instrument, in order to make it sound the best, you want a good hard finish. Your finish gets harder and harder and harder and harder as it ages. And that's why the older instruments sound better than the newer instruments. That, that Once that gets really firm and brittle, then it rings and it cracks and it pops and it really does a lot of amazing things. When you put on a soft finish, that's why I don't recommend polyurethane type finishes because they're softer and they don't get real hard. Now, there's a caveat there too. I mean, I have heard good sounding instruments made with polyurethane finishes. But if you're gonna go to all the trouble to make an instrument, why use second best? Use the best you can get, you know? And the best you can get is a, something that's going to get really hard. That's why nitrocellulose lacquer is a good choice also, because over time, it gets harder and harder and harder and harder. Does it finish crack? Yeah, because what happens is people always think it's because the wood dries out, and it's exactly the opposite. Wood expands. It expands way more than it shrinks. Way more. It, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a sponge. Do you ever see a sponge shrink? I mean, the, I mean, sure. If it gets totally dried out, they'll shrink down to their size. But once they're down to that size, do they shrink anymore? No, they don't. But will they expand if they get wet? You doggone tootin', they will. And that's the same way wood is. Wood, once it gets dried, and it's been dried down to six percent in the kiln before they built your instrument. How is it going to get any drier? It's not but it can get wetter. And that's where your finishes start to crack. So as, that finish, as the finish gets old and dried and hard, when that 
when you when you humidify it or get too much humidity in there, it's going to expand that wood and it's going to crack your finish. Period. End of discussion. You may believe what you want to, but that's how your finish gets cracked. And lac lacquer is really good for that because it doesn't expand once it gets hard, you know. And so an oil varnish can do the same thing too. It seems like oil varnish maybe has a little bit more flex to it, but oil varnish gets very hard. It's a very, very good finish. Shellac gets really hard. It's a very, very good finish. The reason I don't use shellac, which is French polish, by the way, um, it's just how you apply but the reason I don't use shellac is because if you sweat on it, it's going to turn milky white. I sweat a lot. And I know most musicians that are serious musicians sweat a lot. So it's not a good choice, in my opinion. It's a great choice for, I mean, it's a great choice for acoustic sound. Shellac might be your best acoustic sounding finish there is. But it's not a durable finish, and therefore I don't use it. That's just that simple. Okay, um, so I can't tell you the differences, Mike, but that's the best explanation about finishes I've got. How do you create or repair flat surface for the nut on the guitar? My old and new nut were wobbly. I used to file, but messed it up. Well, the problem with filing... Uh, Okay, this is Jacob's video channel is the username. Um, the problem with filing is, it, it's, well, it's the problem with everything with filing. It doesn't matter if you're talking, you know, filing the nut, you know, this way or, you know, across the channel this way. Um, the problem is the file does this. It rocks. And it does this. It rocks this way, too. So that's the problem with filing, though I'll admit I typically do file that channel. I use a square file, and it's, it's probably more the method than it is the filing itself. So when I have to file something, and I don't have any good examples here, but I set it on there as flat as I can set it, and then I actually will take, I can't really show this very well, but I'll actually take my other fingers and I'll keep it flat, which won't let it, won't let it do this. And I'll just rub it. And I don't go. I don't take big strokes, you know, because that that's just going to cause you problems. I just take little strokes like this, and I just work it back and forth, and I keep it flat. And it's the method more than it is anything, and that will eventually get it perfectly flat if you do it that way. And the only problem with with even saying that is I see so much stuff that I'm gun shy with everything. <laughs> and that is that like the end of your fretboard could already be boogered up, if you will. It could have glue on it and all that. So you want it all clean. You want it straight up and down. You want, you know, so you want to have everything as good as you can when you start that filing. So that's the best I got for you. But I typically do file it. It's just that you got to be really careful and you got to be really good with your method. And you got to make sure that it doesn't do this or have the opportunity to do this. You want to find your plane and stay in your plane. And it's the same way when you're filing these slots. You don't want to rock these slots. You want to find your plane and stay in your plane when you're filing these slots. Just that black and white. It's really not any more to it than that. It's not any more complicated than that. That's all there is to it. I hope that helps you. <clears throat> Please contrast this with the guitar method. Um, the mandolin method? Well, the mandolin method is way more detailed. The guitar method that I showed um, is on a high level, and it's assuming you already know how to play a guitar, basically. And I don't get into the super detail on the guitar like I do on the mandolin. Um, that's the contrast, the best contrast I can give you. The, the mandolin training is very long. It's many hours worth of training. Um, you can skip through a lot of it because you can kind of tell where you're at with it. And you can go, well, I don't need this part. I can go to this, you know, further. And... Uh, it's, it's laid out fairly logically. I think there's something like 20-some files, and you just kind of take them in numerical order. Um, 
that's it. I'm going fishing. <laughs> Got a bunch of thumbs up. Um, and I guess it's, maybe that's his username. I'm not really sure. Anyway, um, looking for the next question. James Copy or Cope or K-O-P-P-E. I am a Cincy in Judo nut. I... I, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble. I told you I'm a terrible reader. I'm having trouble understanding what you're saying here. Um, well, James, I don't think I can relate to the judo thing and tell you if it's similar to the experience I have as a luthier. I, I don't know that I can relate it. I'm sorry. I wish I, I, I don't know enough about judo at all to even, even speak to it. So... I wish I could chime in there with you, but I don't think I can because I don't know how to tell you. Um, JJ is asking, what would you do to the sound if you put a finish on the inside of the body? You would kill it. You do not ever want to put finish on the inside of your instrument. I have said many times on video that I don't let anybody hear an instrument until it's got finish on it. I used to do that. And then when they heard it after the finish, they go, oh, what happened to it? I'm telling you for sure. If you don't put any finish on them at all, they sound better. I mean, lots better. And you probably are going, well, why do we put finish on them? Well, they won't last. They'll get dirty and they just look grimy and nasty if you don't put finish on them. You got to put finish on them. But... You definitely don't want to put finish on the inside if just putting it on the outside changes it that much. So that's the whole story right there in a nutshell. You definitely do not want to finish the inside of an instrument. Let's see. I'm trying to read a question. If there's any more here, I think we might be running out. Um... The next one I see is from Lloyd DeSalt Sr. says, how about lacquer over shellac sealer as a finish? That would probably be okay, Lloyd. I, I've i kind of done that. Yeah, I mean, I think I actually did that on... Yeah, I did. I did that on my uh, world's finest mandolin ever built by a human. I put shellac over it first. My thought was I was trying to seal it a little bit, and I was also trying to seal that color in. Um and I wanted something quick and dirty, and the shellac works pretty good. And I think I sprayed it on even. So yeah, you can do that. And, and I did that on, on the mandolin. Bill O'Reilly says, What is the material that violin strings rest on the tailpiece, the saddle? Bill O'Reilly, let me see. What is the material that violin strings rest on on the tailpiece, the saddle? Oh, okay, the, the saddle on the tailpiece of a violin is, um, typically it's just ebony. Typically it's just ebony. But it it's probably there just to keep it from buzzing. That's probably all it's there for. It does, I don't think it truly adds much to the sound one way or the other. I don't think so. I could be wrong on that. I mean, it may help with the sustain and all that too. I, I suppose it probably does. I hadn't really thought about it to be truthful, but it's a good question. And But typically the ones I see are typically ebony. Um, now these new composite ones... They're probably just the composite material, as far as I can remember. I don't, re I don't recall them using anything special in there. So that's a good question. I just didn't quite understand it at the beginning there. Okay, I apologize in advance, says, uh, does Emery have plans to record her new songs? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I'm hoping that we can do that eventually. Uh, I, I am starting to get my recording studio back in place. You know, I really thought I was an expert on that recording studio when I had it in my actual studio because I was using it all the time and I felt like I was an expert. And I'll be 
doggone if I haven't forgot just about everything I know about that thing. And I'm having trouble. I'm struggling to get it back to where I was. And so I'm really not ready to record anybody until then. Doesn't mean she couldn't go somewhere else and record it, but that probably won't happen. If I don't do it, she'll probably never do it. <laughs> okay, um, I'm going to take one more question. In, uh, sorry that I'm going to have to cut it off here, but uh, it, we've gone our full hour, so and then a little bit. Um, J.J. says, so the finish is like a blanket or muffler until it cures and gets harder. Well, that's absolutely 100% true. Uh, especially a soft finish. It is just like throwing a blanket over your instrument. I've said that many times, actually. I've said those exact words. It's just like putting a blanket over your instrument. So you don't want to put a soft finish on your instrument. Um, you want something that's going to get hard and get crisp and vibrate. I mean, you could kind of, I don't know, it's hard to give you a good example of that because there's always exceptions to every example. But yeah, you definitely want something hard, crisp, that's going to vibrate. All right, there is just, looks like two more questions. I'll see if I can get them in real quick. Jerry, how have you deal with high heat humidity in your part of the country? Uh, well, I keep the shop, in, uh, I keep the shop um, air conditioned and my house is air conditioned. And truly, I believe as long as you do that, that knocks the humidity out, and you're fine. If you don't do that, then you probably need to take some other kind of measures. But, uh, you know, I always say you don't need to humidify, you don't need to dehumidify your instrument. You don't need to do anything special as long as you just kind of keep it in a controlled environment. If you take an instrument that was built in the jungle and you bring it to some place up here that is air-conditioned, it's going to shrink like crazy. Um, you know, if you t conversely, if you take one that's built in the driest place on earth, maybe the Arizona desert, I don't know, and then you bring it to the tropical rainforest, it's going to swell up like a balloon. So as long as you can kind of control your environment, you're just absolutely fine. And uh, so you have to understand these instruments were dried down to 6%. If you keep them in a controlled house, like a normal house, they're going to be just fine. You don't need to do anything extra. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Guys, I'm going to let that be it for today. Thank you so much for joining me. It looks like 133 viewers right now, so we didn't do too bad. Um, I'm a little disappointed we're not getting back up in those high numbers like we used to, so maybe my shop talks are just not that interesting. But I do appreciate you all tuning in, and uh, we'll see you on the, the next video uh, probably yet tonight. There'll probably be one, and then uh, we'll certainly see you on Monday. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.